Well, hello everyone. This is Carrie Beck with How to Homeschool My Child, and this workshop is Approaches to Christian Homeschooling. How to choose Christian homeschool curriculum for your children. And really some prep work that you're going to need to do. So we're going to spend a little bit of time on the prep work. We're going to talk about the different approaches to Christian homeschooling. Um, but I just want to thank you for taking time out of your busy day to be here. And I'm going to just jump right in. And these are my kids. We homeschooled for about 10 years. And I'd like to share a little bit about them so you know where I'm coming from and so that you know that I'm not just making this up or researching it. I actually live through homeschooling. I was a public school teacher for six years and got a master's in curriculum and instruction. I can read curriculum backwards, forwards, upside down if we need to. But these are my guinea pigs. And so right smack dab in the middle is Ashley. She is holding Faith. She is married to Jesse, who is holding Elizabeth. And they are our cute little grandbabies. And they live in Austin. Uh, Jesse works at Samsung. Ashley actually does works at the children's department in their church part time and runs the children's um, the kids area of church. Gentry is next to her. She is our middle daughter. She is married to Andrew. They live up in North Dallas. Andrew runs security for Cowboy Stadium, fifteen hundred employees on a cowboy game. And then Gentry actually runs events for a nonprofit up in North Dallas as well. And then the baby of the family is Hunter, even though he is the tallest and he is not married. He lives in Houston and does some management consulting uh, for a firm down there. But he goes from one company to the next project to project. I like to share that with you to let you know that one, homeschooling was not our first choice. My kids went to private school and we had some issues there and we weren't really sure. I said I would never homeschool. And yet God really worked in our hearts and moved us into homeschool. Uh, and so I say that no matter where you feel, if you have some insecurities, you do not need to be a professional teacher. In fact, I've had to retrain my mind and change my whole perspective. I actually think being a teacher, um, is a detriment and it makes it a little more difficult because when I actually, the first homeschool conference that I ever went to, I knew exactly what grammar program I was going to get. I was getting this one because it made sure I, they knew all the parts of speech and everything. So I didn't, I thought I'll just wait and get that at the end of Saturday. We had Friday and Saturday. I went home Friday night, started looking and pouring over some of the information that I got and God really changed my heart. And it, pushed me to a curriculum I never would have chosen, never would have dreamed, but it was the beginning of opening myself up and opening up our homeschool to non-traditional approaches, not your typical public school textbook approach. I used something called Simply Grammar. I loved it because it integrated grammar into reading and writing. It was not a subject in and of itself. Now I share that story to say, listen to God. That was something that I had to pay attention to where is God leading me in all of this? You know, we're going to cover a lot of information today. We're going to talk about freedoms and philosophy of education, Christian education and goals. That's going to take up a good chunk at the beginning of our time together. Then we're going to really delve into the different approaches to homeschooling and then helping you be able to choose what's best. But I just want to applaud you for homeschooling. You know, God has given you your kids, you are their authority and it's a God ordained authority. The home is really the only institution I know that's ordained by God as far as leading our kids and raising our kids. We look at Timothy and we see that he was taught by both his mom and his grandma. So it was a generational thing. And so I think it's important that we realize where we are. We're coming from a perspective where God has ordained the home and I believe he's ordained education as well for you. Did we always homeschool? No, we homes we private schooled, we homeschooled, and then we Hunter even went back to the private school the last three years, and it was a God thing. I can share the story some other time, but um, it was definitely one week before school started. It was so obvious that God was telling our whole family, "This is where I want Hunter to be." So let's talk about what homeschooling does allow. It allows us a lot of freedoms. We can choose what to study when to study, how to learn, how long to study, what type of educational experiences. You know, if you're a morning person, you can study in the morning. If you're a night owl, y'all can study in the evening. I could never do it. 
I'd be falling asleep. But we have a lot of freedoms in homeschooling. But what happens too often is we try to imitate this. We try to bring school into our home. We bring that conveyor belt into our home. And all that does is lead to frustration and burnout. And so we don't take advantages of those um, freedoms. Here's what we could be doing. Look at those boys down at the bottom. They're just sitting around the table doing their schoolwork. One of them doesn't even have a shirt on. This is just sort of natural time of day. Look at those girls. If you saw the rest of the pictures, you see they were all out on a field trip at the pond. They're looking at those fish. You can tell maybe they're not quite so sure about that fish. But do you think they learn more about fish that day or if they went and read a textbook and answered some questions about it? My guess is that this type of education is actually going to teach our kids something. They will truly learn. And so we're going to be talking about those approaches. But before we can answer the question, which approach I should use, because that's probably why you're on here. Well, tell me all about the approaches and then help me figure out which one I want to use. Before you can really answer how to homeschool, what approach to homeschool, I think there are a few preliminary questions that you need to think about. And the first question is, what is an educated person? And then we're going to talk about goals as well. When we determine what an educated person is, then we can have a place that we are moving towards. What do we want our child to look like? Now, if you want them to do the same, if an educated person is someone with a high school degree, you're going to give them a public education. Basically, that is what to think. They are taught to follow their teacher. They are never taught really how to think for themselves. They are taught what to think and how to regurgitate information back to them. This is... Um, Public education was actually begun in the Middle Ages because they wanted the poor people to be productive in society. So they sort of corralled all their money and started a public education for these poor people so that they could then be uh, productive in society. They could have jobs and, um, and have a part in society. Now, if you want your kids to maybe think an educated person is one that has a college degree or finishes a trade school or some sort of certificate, you would give them a professional education. Here is when they are taught when to think. This is like maybe a mechanic school. Clunk, 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 your car sounds like this. And so we need to fix it this way. They could also be a doctor. You have a patient come in. They've got a pain on their calf. This is what you do. You know what to do when this happens. That is a competitive conveyor belt. The first one's a conveyor belt. The next one is a competitive conveyor belt. They have the tools. Um, but then you may be going, I want something greater than that. I want my kids to have the tools of learning. I want them to have a love of learning. Then I would say you're probably looking at something called a leadership education. Someone that knows how to think, how to think for themselves how to be leaders in their homes and their communities, how to be leaders in entrepreneurs, um, statesmen in government, all of those types of things, how to lead well. Three types of education, you have to decide which one would be the definition of your educated person. Just because I chose something doesn't mean it's for everyone. But those are some thoughts that I really think you need to go on. We're not going to talk a lot about leadership education, but I will tell you the um, – the non-traditional approaches I share will help with that. I have a whole other workshop, I have a book, I have some actually a book series on leadership education. So if you're interested in more details about that, you can go see Raising Leaders, Not Followers, a biblical and a great a biblical perspective of leadership education, and then teach your children how to think with mentoring. Both of those really go together well to give you a leadership education. So you may be wondering who this man is. His name is Mortimer Adler. He wrote a book called How to Read a Book. And he, he spent a lifetime studying education. He believed in um, a variety of education, but he believed education served three purposes. To teach people how to use their leisure time well. Now think about it. Are you teaching your kids how to use their free time well? You know, that's something we might really be concerned about. Education isn't just our academics. To teach people how to earn their living ethically. Most of us can agree to that. Yes, we want our kids to get a job, be able to do their job well. 
and then to um, teach people to be responsible citizens in a democracy. How do we get along? That type of thing. Mortimer Adler believed that each person has the innate ability to do these three things and that education should above all prepare people to become lifelong learners. Education never ends. In his view, age 60 is the earliest that anyone can claim to be truly educated and only then if they had devoted their life to learning. I think that really encourages us to take a step back about what is an educated person. According to someone who has specialized and spent his life researching education, he says you can't do it till you're 60 and only then if you've devoted your entire life to learning and loving learning. Just something to think about. So the first question I want to ask you is, what is an educated person to you? And you can write that down. The next thing we want to talk about is a Christian education, because I think it's important. I believe everything that we do goes through the grid of scripture. And so we need to not only just look at education, look at it from a Christian perspective. And I believe that this is one definition of Christian education, to cultivate wisdom and virtue through nurturing the soul in truth, goodness, and beauty. So what do we mean? Wisdom as far as knowledge, not just knowledge for knowledge's sake, but applied knowledge. We want our kids to make wise decisions, to be wise leaders, but also to be virtuous, to have godly character so that they can lead well, so that they can do what God has and have an impact on society. How do we do this? We nurture their soul. It's not just making them do the things we want. We want them to really nurture their soul and nurture their heart so that they are doing this. And it's an inner change as well as an outer change as they learn um, different topics and as they learn how to follow God. We do this by teaching them about truth, goodness, and beauty. As we look at history, what is truthful in what the people did, what was good, what was beautiful. As we look at science, what is truth, what is good, and what is beauty. We're not, this is a quick overview, but um, so anyway, that will give you a little bit of an idea of what's going on. But we're, those are the things we need to do. I think the biggest thing you wanna capture is wisdom and virtue with your kids and nurturing the soul. And then talking about what's true, what's good and beautiful. But the whole purpose of that, we one, we want to do that with the biblical worldview, not just out of our head, so that we can know, glorify, and enjoy God. There is a big picture. And this is a lot. We're not going to spend a lot of time really delving into this. This is just a synopsis of one way we can look at a Christian education or a Christian homeschool. We want to raise our kids to be wise and virtuous. We want their soul to be nurtured in who God is so that they understand from a biblical perspective what is true, what is good and beautiful. And the whole purpose of that is to be able to know God better, to glorify him, and then to enjoy him as well. So you might have a little different definition, but you might need to write down what is a Christian education to you. Next, we want to take, this is what an educated person is, so what goals are we going to have in the long run? And only after defining an educated person can you begin to look at your goals. And I think it's important that we write them down and be as specific as possible. Now, for most of us, first two things we're going to think of is we want our kids to be able to obtain a job. We want them to think well for themselves, maybe. We want them to have that virtue and that wisdom in their job situation and then go to college. Those are good things. Just think about it. You may not have those particular um, goals. Um, maybe, you're, maybe you have a child that isn't going to go to college. That's okay. I told my kids they needed to have a purpose. They didn't always listen to me. Some of them just wanted to go to college, go to college. But um, I believe that if they were going to college and we were going to pay for it, they needed to have a reason for that as well. Maybe one of your goals is that the kids would be prepared for adult life. Prepare for that job, but also prepared for marriage, to be a good mom and a dad, to be a good um, husband and wife, to be able to lead a family well, to be able to have a ministry, to manage their home well, maybe to change the oil, to be able to have carpentry. Steve used to have our kids, he used to do um, life skill camps, and Hunter and him built um, a playhouse in someone's backyard one time, and then they were all here on the uh, driveway one time, and it was all boys. They were out there building bookshelves. And we still have a, the bookshelf that Hunter built. He still has that. 
but um, you know, maybe teaching them how to maintain things around the house, how to use different tools. One of our personal real life skills and adult skills was business. And I was actually visiting with Hunter yesterday and he was naming some of the things that he really enjoyed about homeschooling. And one of them, he said, as out of the top three or four things that he was appreciative of homeschool, he was like, I'm so glad that you gave me business skills. And I wasn't just academics. You gave me skills that I could use around the house. And I said, can I use that in my next workshop? And he's like, sure, mom. But seriously, we wanted our kids. We've had a family business since 1985, a variety of them. We want our kids to have business skills so that they were able to earn money if they lost their job or needed a way to earn money. Um, they did, weren't always dependent on other people. So we have a whole section. Normally I do tell people like Steve has eight hour course on teach your children how to start your own business. And it was teens that he ran an eight hour course. You get a workbook, you get videos and it shows you how to basically brainstorm your ideas to um, price your things, to market it, to bookkeeping and all of those things. And those are things because our kids were involved in our lives because they were involved in our business and all they learned those skills just by being part of our family. Now I will say this, we did not expect them to work in our business for free. We actually paid them well. In college, my daughter Gentry's friends were like, does your mom have another job? Cause you get paid really well. But she knew what she was doing and I could hand it off and she could take care of all our shipping and bookkeeping and that kind of thing. So we did, we don't, we never expected our kids to work for free. Another goal you may have, oh, there it is, business skills, family business. We've already done that one. Is maybe you want your kids to be self learners or to be able to think independently. Then you would want to, if that's one of your goals, part of your homeschool and the approach you're going to use would be something to provide the tools of learning. Um, you would want to choose a approach that develops a love of learning and the tools of learning and then gives them critical thinking skills. You know, when I go back, like adult life, business skills, family business, you would want uh, an approach that teaches good habits and um, gives yourself time to do things outside of just your academics. Um, or maybe you want to do some hands on learning, that type of thing. Uh, Another goal you may have is that your kids are mature in Jesus Christ to train them in righteousness so that they truly love God's word. They follow his commands regardless of how difficult they are. And that is an awesome task. And that does require wisdom, virtue, truth, goodness, and beauty from a biblical worldview. When I look at those, and those are just some goals. So those are some of the goals that we had. We had a full orbed philosophy of education. What I mean by that is these were all goals that we had. It wasn't just academics. Academics was a huge part of our homeschool, but um, academics with a purpose. And these were some of the things that we had. And one of our verses, this was actually Steve's verse, Colossians 1, 28 through 29. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end, I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. I, although Paul's talking about Colossae and the men there that he had been discipling, I think it has, this is a very good verse about home discipleship and home education. Him we preach, we're going to teach our kids about Jesus Christ, and we are going to warn them and teach them in all wisdom. Like, we, well, I mean, wisdom just comes up over and over. Why? So that we can present each one of our kids perfect in Christ. That doesn't mean they are sinless. That just means that they are maturing Christ. They are maturing and getting closer to Christ likeness. And how, what is my part in this? It says to this end, I also labor. You are in the trenches and it is a lot of hard work and you are going to be tired and just accept it. This is the season of life you're in. It is hard work, but it's not just you. You are striving according to God's working, which works inside of you mightily. So this is, you're working hard, but it is God working through you at the same time. And I think it's really important that we keep that perspective that God is working through us. It's not us doing this all by ourselves. And I think that will help us determine what our goals are. So let's move to that. How do we discover our goals and our education philosophy? Number one thing, pray. 
and read your Bible. Pray, 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 and pray some more. I think too often it's so easy and we go, oh yeah, we're gonna pray about this. And we pray for three minutes, maybe five minutes, maybe 15 minutes. Pray every single day about your kids and what you're doing. I wish I, I prayed, I did pray every morning. I prayed for my kids, I prayed with my kids. But I still look back and go, I wish I prayed even more with them. Now, some of that's one, two minute prayers. You know, I heard Craig Groeschel say, I don't pray long, but I don't go long without praying. And I think that's really encouraging for homeschool moms and dads. Sometimes we can't get in a 30 minute prayer session, but we could pray for a minute or two and we keep it constantly in front of us. Use your phone, put timers on your phone. That's what I do to remind myself to pray for certain things. And also read your Bible. I think it's important to pull out principles from the Bible, just like Colossians 1. It doesn't say that shall not use the Charlotte Mason approach of homeschooling, but there are principles about raising your children. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. All right, those that's a principle that doesn't tell you classical or unit study but you can use that principle as you decide which approach you want to is best for you then talk about it with your spouse steve and i used to go on dates right before school started specifically about school and we i would sort of run through things that i was thinking about doing that particular year and so i would talk about it and if we were having problems he would come right alongside i remember one of our children was arguing with me about his physical science you got that little pronoun his about his physical science answer and he was like no it's right it's right and Steve was working at home he walked out and he says if your mother says it's wrong it's wrong and that was the end of the discussion and he was like correct it and then he walked back in his office you know so discuss things with your spouse be on the same page um, and then if you're a single mom find an older woman that you could talk to Find someone who's already lived through parenting a little bit. If you find someone from your church, or if you can find someone in your homeschool area, that's great. But not find someone from your church. If not, email me. Pick up the phone and call me. Let's set up a phone appointment. I would be happy to talk to you and see what your needs are, where your kids are, what your goals are, and then let's see what's best for you. And then do some research. I said limited because we can spend hours upon hours in front of that computer and yet we never make a decision and we never do anything with our kids and we're not building a relationship. So get some research, get some information and then pray about it, make a choice and then move on. How do we choose the best approach? We're gonna talk about this a little bit beforehand and then we'll follow up with it when I finish going through all the different approaches. Again, pray and read your Bible. It sounds like a broken record, but really those are the most important things that you can be doing. Go to God. God will really show you. And sometimes maybe just pray and listen. And that's really hard when you have little kids. But pray in the shower, pray in the car, put on a video or uh, music if you're driving to grandma's. And you spend time praying about your homeschool and about raising your kids. Again, discuss it with your spouse and single moms talk, find an older woman. But look at your family. Look, every family is different. Just because something works for one family doesn't mean it's going to work for another family. If you have one child, your homeschool is going to look different than your best friend who has six or eight kids. So pay attention to your family. If you live out in the country, your homeschool is going to look different than someone that lives in the city. And so you are going to have different needs and different styles of life. Just if you live in the country and you have animals, you've got to get up and feed those animals or do the garden or do whatever. That's going to look a lot different than someone that's got to deal with traffic every day. So look at your family and see what's going to jive with you the best. Look at your kids. Your kids all have different learning styles. And this isn't necessarily a whole workshop on learning styles. But I think I am going to do a workshop like that. So be looking out. I might even do it this summer. Look at your kids' learning style. If they're a type A person, you may be leaning more towards a very structured organization one. If they're a loosey-goosey and you can live with it, you might be doing more of a unit study and hands-on kind of thing. Look at your kids' personalities. And if they're struggling with something, find an approach that works best with that area that they are struggling finally look at your personality and let's go back to that type a maybe you're a type a personality and your kids are loosey-goosey you're probably not going to have art supplies all over the kitchen table every day so you know you need something that's more of a structure type thing 
But if you're a little bit loosey goosey and you can handle a little bit of more freedom, you might be more of, hey, let's just do science experiments all day long today. You know, you might be able to handle something like that. So look at your family, look at your kids, look at your personality, bathe it in prayer, bathe it in God and listen to see what he has for you. Um, my goals, I always like to share my goals a little bit. And my reason for doing any of this is I go down to El Salvador eight to 10 times a year. I work with a group called Shelter the Homeless International Project. We have about 80 kids going to a private Christian school. We're hoping next year to start our own Christian school. Hopefully I integrate a little bit of homeschool principles in there because we definitely want to integrate more than academics. We want these kids to grow up loving God and having character godly character, but we do a lot of good things. We were model homes, we have clean water, but we do it all for one reason. We build relationships with the kids. We build relationships with the families through the kids. And we earn the right to share Jesus, to share Jesus love and Jesus salvation. I share that because anything that you invest in my website or when you hear me speaking, all the profits go back to Shelter the Homeless International Project. And I just like for people to know if they were to buy something from me, you would know what's happening to your profits as well. So all the money goes back down to El Salvador. That's just a quick little comment. But let's hop into the um, approach that we all know and love so dearly, and that's the traditional textbook approach. And I would really consider some of this is like a factory school, and it is like being on a conveyor belt. All kids enter on stage one. They're all given the same activities, the same responsibilities, the same everything, because we have an average kid, and they are given a test. They are evaluated to move to stage two on the conveyor belt, and three, and four, and all the way down to stage 12. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then when they're finished with stage 10, 12, they are approved for the market, the job market. Now, that sort of simplifies things, but really, you're always dealing with an average child when you are traditional approach, a textbook approach. So you need to be really careful. A lot of people homeschool to get away from this approach. And I think sometimes there's artificial learning experiences. We got to do something. So let's artificially engineer something for them to do in these textbooks. I also think it gives your moms a false sense of security. They are more dependent on the textbook than they are paying attention to God or paying attention to their kids. So I think that's really important. I do think there are times to use textbook. I think when you need to learn a body of information such as high school science or high school um, math, you may want to use that. But I heard a very unique way of using a um, textbook. And that was my friend, Andrew Pudua. His child was going to do biology and he said, okay, child, find nine topics in this textbook that you're interested in. She goes and spends some time looking, writes them all down. He goes, okay, put the textbook away. Don't tell your mom, put the textbook away. All right, this first month, I want you to take topic one and we're going to do some research on it. And then you're going to write a paper on it by the end of the month. Then we'll do topic two the next month, nine months nine topics. That's how they did biology. Now, you, that may not feel comfortable to you. That may not be your personality, but that is a creative way to use a textbook as well. So I think it's really important that we do that. I'm about to go into all the non-traditional approaches. Before I do that, I want to give um, a little commercial, but a little introduction because I'm going to go really fast and I can't go into detail on every single one of these approaches. This is just a one hour overview. I, I think it's very important that you know where you're headed. Without a vision, the people perish. That's why I spend a lot of time on what is an educated person? What are your goals? How do we do that from a Christian perspective? So if for some reason you are interested in any one of these approaches in more detail, you can actually get the recordings and the transcript here. And you can see I've got all the approaches listed, howtohomeschoolmychild.com slash approaches. I also have a paperback book that has all of this information in it. And you can see Trivium and Discussions, uh, Charlotte Mason, Living Books, Copywork, Grammar, History, Real Life Learning, Unit Studies, Pinterest, um, Struggling, Biblical Worldview, Leadership, Notebooking, Math, Writing, all of these different things are all included in my paperback. It is a 209-page paperback with a study guide. Um, 
you can get that individually or you can get our complete package. The package includes the paperback, the video recordings of each one of the ones I listed at the beginning and the transcripts and then a digital resource guide. I'll talk about that at the end, but basically every type of approach is in the resource guide. And when you find a resource under Charlotte Mason, you like you click on it and it takes you to wherever you can get that or get a review about that resource. Um, and this, our workshop special would be $154.95 if we did it individually, but it's $27 because you're listening to this workshop. It does, the price does increase $5 every other day. So we got all of that and, or you may get just the paperback for $16.95 and really quick, last little bit of the commercial. Well, my guarantee, I have searched the internet. I actually used all of this. It took me years to figure out what I was doing. Seriously, three or four years. I tried classical. I tried Charlotte Mason. I unit studies. I blended it all together. I'll share more about that, but really you have nothing to lose because I have a 30 day money back guarantee. And that is less than taking your family to see. I can only imagine, which came out a few months ago. And then we do have some 24 hour bonuses. If you buy within the next 24 hours, you can get my husband, Stephen Beck's Making Biblical Decisions. It's an ebook and nine practical daily tips for successful homeschooling. That's something I wrote. And our bonuses for the entire week are best books of all times, classic book lists, time management, and 470 crock pot recipes. I love that because I needed the crock pot when I was actually homeschooling and 51 ways to organize your home. You can get all of that at howtohomeschoolmychild.com slash approaches. I know that's a short little commercial, but um, that does help pay for the website fees and all of that. And like I said, after I pay my website fees and all our overhead, then the profits go back down to El Salvador. So let's talk about non-traditional approaches. That was quick. Um, Let's talk just for a minute about public education and liberal education, because I think this is important. We, most of us grew up in a public or a private education. It's got that conveyor belt, but we want something better. We want something different. And I would really encourage you to consider a liberal education, not in the sense of liberal arts even, but in the sense that a liberal education liberates your child from their teacher. It frees your child from their teacher. And a public education makes your child a slave to the system, a slave to the teacher. Most graduates can only take tests. Uh, and that's really what's been going on the last 100, 150 years. Most of us are looking for the non-traditional approaches to homeschooling. And I'd like to share something. A man named John Gatto, who was New York City teacher of the year once and New York State teacher of the year twice out on the entire state of New York. He went on to write a book about the history of American education and it was so revealing. I reveal some of what he's written in my Raising Leaders Not Followers um, workshop, but one of his comments that I really liked was he said, rule books educate, school books school. Real books educate, school books school. Just think about that. Really, our school books are schooling our kids. They are following that government industry of education and checklists. And we are in too productive a society as it is. I believe we need our kids to be able to think for themselves, for them to be able to get out and be free from their teacher and have those tools of learning. And I believe real books are the best way to do that. All of the non-traditional approaches I share use real books and I'll share different ways that the real books are used and sort of some ideas about what those are as well. So let's just jump right into the classical approach. Great minds have been uh, trained through the classical approach it began back in the Greek and Roman time. The founders of our um, country were trained in the classical approach. But Dorothy Sayers during World War II became a modern proponent of the classical approach. She was working with eighth graders and having some real difficulties with them to get them to be successful. And so she began to reinstate the classical education of the Middle Ages. And she became hugely successful. Her eighth graders went on to be very successful in school and in life. And you may be thinking, well, yeah, she was at some prep school. Nope. Dorothy Sayers was working in inner city Chicago with kids that did not have the support that they needed to be successful. And she used classical education 
to make to help them be successful the end goal of classical education really is virtue and wisdom and we do that through developing characters through the developing discernment with them so classical education from a christian perspective is aimed at apprehending truth goodness and beauty and finally acquiring virtue and wisdom and i think that's an awesome goal there are seven liberal arts in classical education we're going to only talk about the first three, but let me go on to tell you the last four are mathematics, music, astronomy, and geometry. So that means after the first 12 years of school, they began to study math, music, astronomy, and geometry. Just the opposite of what we do in America. We start those kids on math in kindergarten and first grade. Now, I got a whole section in... I think approaches and maybe raising leaders about ideas about math. I'm not going to go in. I don't have time to do that, but you know, there are some thoughts about teaching our kids language first and then teaching math later. So let's back up and let's go. The first three um, arts of the classical liberal arts are grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And you thought they were just like literature and music and art. No, really the first three arts are grammar. This is the elementary stage. This is where our kids gain knowledge. Elementary schools used to be called grammar schools because the grammar schools, the grammar stage sets a foundation. It's not just English grammar. It's grammar in all ages. The grammar of math is times tables and addition tables and um, shapes. The grammar of history are dates and people and events. The grammar of grammar, English, are parts of speech that periods and punctuation. Every subject has a grammar. Um, that's, uh, so we need to set a foundation. And so I like the, these stages because I also believe they go along child developmentally. At this age, kids love repetition. And so you can use songs and verses and poems, and you can do the same thing over and over with them just to sort of get those grammar, that foundation in them. We tease at my house that the way my kids learned the direct object is um, the grammar songs, because as I would play those, they were like, Mom, we can't get that out of our heads. And I thought, bingo, that's what I want. I was laying a foundation for grammar. They were just learning what it was. And the song says a direct object receives the action from the verb. And if you ask any of my kids right now, and I said, what is a direct object? They would start to sing that song just like I did in my head. It's a very easy way to do it. We have times tables, geography songs, all sorts of songs and ways that we can do this. Memorization skills are important. Listening skills, observation skills are important at this stage. Um, and some people will introduce Latin at this stage. A truly very formal classical will begin to um, do Latin because Latin is a basis of the English vocabulary, the English language. So there are reasons that why they're starting there. Dialectic or logic stage, that is understanding from a Christian perspective. It's knowledge in the grammar stage and then understanding. And I would say this begins about the age 12, 13. When your child starts arguing with you, you know you have entered the logic stage and you need to teach them how to argue logically. And so I would encourage you to either get a formal or an informal logic um, course. We did both in our in our family, but we wanted to teach them how to have a logical discussion, how to debate, how to correctly draw conclusions and support conclusions with facts. And this, I would equip them with different thinking skills at this time. They would read essays and arguments, and instead of just events, they might learn the cause and the um, cause and effect of an event. So you, they're beginning to, those abstract thinking skills are just starting to kick in at 12 and 13. I don't really think it's necessary to teach critical thinking at five, six, seven, eight years old. They are literal thinkers. They don't become abstract thinkers until later. And then the last stage is the rhetoric stage, or we would call that wisdom from Proverbs. Knowledge, understanding, and wisdom, grammar, logic, and rhetoric from a classical perspective. And I believe this starts about age 15. And this is where our kids learn to use language, both written and spoken, eloquently and persuasively. And this is a chance. We ought to be having discussion all the time, but we really need to focus on discussion during the rhetoric stage. My whole book, Teach Your Children How to Think with Mentoring, um, deals a lot with this rhetoric stage, although it's not classical rhetoric, but talks all about getting our kids to write, 
and speak eloquently and persuade people, get their point across and know how that they can do that as well. So those, that would be something, and I think this is, you know, a very formal classical is going to be very structured. But one thing I use this for is the child development stages. And so I pick different things at their ages that I thought were pertinent that they needed. So we did a lot of repetition memorization at the younger ages. We did do some logic and some argument and fallacy looking. And then at the rhetoric stage, they did write a research paper. We had discussions on a regular basis to get them to think for themselves and be able to persuade. The next approach is the Charlotte Mason approach. And by the way, each one of these approaches in those workshops, the videos and the transcripts, I have so much more detail about it. I have resources that you use and specific ways. I can only say so much in a one hour uh, workshop anyway. But let's move on to the Charlotte Mason approach or the living books approach. She was appalled at the tendencies of education back in the 1800s. She believed that education was treating children as containers to be filled with predigested information instead of humans, that we treated as humans and we train them as human beings to have good habits, good character, wise and virtuous. She saw that they were breaking down knowledge into thousands of isolated bits of information to be fed to the container child. Sounds like our schools. Break it all up, feed it all to them, regurgitate it. And she also believed that they were engineering artificial learning experiences, something that our schools are doing today very well. She saw this back in the early 1800s. She believed that we needed to change our approach. And the things that she says, I've sort of grouped into the four R's of Charlotte Mason. And one is that we need to respect our children as people. We need to involve them in real life situations. We need to teach them good habits and have broad spectrums. We don't just do reading, writing, and arithmetic. There are other areas of life, godly character that we need to be training them in as well. Um, and we, um, next would be real life learning. Like I just said, there needs to be a purpose to what our kids are doing. Um, education, she believed, failed when it produced children who could do harder sums and read harder books, but who lacked moral and intellectual power. Students were not able to think for themselves. And then she, a lot of people really grab onto this because she believed in reading great books. Classical people also read very good books but she believed in reading great books with living ideas and not twaddle. What do I mean by living book ideas and twaddle? The way I usually illustrate this are some books that my girls read. They read the American Girl books, and then they also read Little House on the Prairie and A Green Gables. And if you read those two, you can really see a huge difference. First, the language is different. American Girls is very choppy and you know, okay, but you look at Little House on the Prairie and Anne Green Gables, and you've got rich, beautiful language, good grammar that's used well. You look at American Girl books, and those characters are not ones that I would want my kids to emulate. They are not following biblical examples. One of them um, sneaks out in the middle of the night to help their friend. Helping their friend is a good thing, but sneak, sneaking out in the middle of the night is not. So even though my kids read it, you still have discussions about what's right and wrong. Little House on the Prairie, well, those kids messed up too, but there were consequences in those books. So those are ideas that we can actually have discussions about and we can um, and verbalize and ask our kids about that. And then finally, relax and rest. And so I think we need to pull back and not be so worked up about everything. We need to not um, be on that productivity conveyor belt. We need to give our kids ample time to play, to reflect, to create. Um, she would usually use her mornings to school and play in the afternoons. I love that because that's pretty much what we did. We schooled in the morning and we played and did fun things. We had that love of learning more in the more. Uh, we started with love of learning and then in the afternoon we had love of learning activities. Another thing she believed was giving our kids the best learning experiences possible, taking them on nature walks, observing and collecting wildlife, visiting art museums that had real paintings in them, books with living ideas, unlike textbooks that were dry and dull and assumed the reader couldn't think for themselves. They probably couldn't think for themselves. You know, I think it's important if you can find places that you can go to the symphony. We have a fourth grade symphony. Everyone, even homeschoolers in fourth grade, can go 
for free to the symphony in our town. Um, I would, Houston's an hour and a half away. I would take my kids to the museum. Poor Hunter, one time we drove down there and he is so excited. And I pull in the parking lot and he goes, oh no, not this museum. It was the fine arts museum. So I was gonna give him quality fine art. He did have to listen to the headset of two or three impressionists because they had real live Monet's right there. You could look at it. I was so excited. He had to listen to about three of those before he could go over to the Star Wars exhibit in the next door museum. So he was happy by the end. He actually grew to love art. He was my only person that would go in London to the art museum with me. So just because they don't like something when they're seven doesn't mean they can't grow into something different. Now, if you've got kids that really need some hands-on, I love hands-on idea learning. I think most kids really learn well. I think that's how we learn the best. I wouldn't say the, stu the unit study approach might be one way that you are um, wanting to approach with your kids. How does this work? Basically, all your learning is centered on a topic. And so let's say we have uh, the topic of astronomy. My kids loved astronomy in high school. And Hunter, we sort of went through this period um, Hunter was in junior high, the girls were in high school, so the girls actually took an online course on astronomy. But we, I, I did a lot of things about astronomy. We could look at the Bible and look at um, the creation, the sun, moon, stars. You could look at the verses with the constellations in there. You could look at the star of Bethlehem or the skies of the moon. If you're interested in either one of these, I wasn't planning on this, but I actually have some resources on my website for both of those. We can look at the history um, like Galileo, read a biography that could be reading in history. We could write about Galileo. We could write about the planets. We could choose one planet, write about it. Um, we could go to a um, planetarium if we wanted to. You could just go outside at night, find a place that doesn't have much city light and look at the constellations. There's a lot you can do to learn about the topic of astronomy. I even did grammar. Yes, grammar. I took Hunter's book on um, astronomy and I took a paragraph out of it and I typed it up and I made mistakes. And that's what he would do each day for his um, grammar work. So I, it is very hands-on and I think it's a great way that families can learn together. If you have older kids, if you have a big family, this might be a way that you do learn every once in a while. Let your older kids plan a unit for your younger kids. I guarantee the older kids are going to learn more about that topic than the younger kids are. I would let the I would choose the topic that the younger kids are interested in because that's who you're sort of planning it all around. Or maybe rotate and every month do a short three day mini unit and um, let every every month is a different kid choosing a topic that they want. There are ways that we can be creative with a bunch of kids as well. So that's the unit studies approach, very hands on, real life learning with the purpose, I believe. Then we have the biblical principle approach. Now there are some groups in uh, the United States that really hone in on this. I'm gonna give you my perspective of the biblical principle approach. I believe that this is just an opportunity for us to filter everything through scripture. And, but some things we are going to really spend more time doing this. One of the um, resources that I used was truth quest history because it always asked who is God and who is mankind. And when I looked at that, I could look at the Pharaohs and go, who is God in that culture? Well, those were Pharaohs that thought they were above everyone else. Who is mankind and how are they treated? They were treated horribly. They were slaves at the um, Pharaoh's whim. They could just do whatever it was. And so was that biblical or unbiblical ways to live? You know, you could discuss that. You can do that with all different subject areas. One thing that I believe is important when you're doing this, and um, even the groups around the United States that follow a principal approach, is the using notebooks. And I'm going to just share the four R's of notebooking. At the bottom of this page, you can get some free notebooking pages, howtohomeschoolmychild.com slash notebooking pages. But the four R's go like this. We would research a topic and we would reason. We would come to a conclusion. And this is more done at the older kids level. You could do this a little bit with the little kids as long as mom and dad were very involved. But this is more for older kids. Research a topic and then reason about that from the truth. Then we are going to take our research and our reasoning and relate it to the Bible, relate it to the truth of scripture, and then sort of integrate those together 
And then when we're finished, we will record our findings in a notebook. Record our any sort of application that we might have found from our biblical principles in that subject area. Because maybe when we look at the pharaohs and we look at the mankind, we may go, oh, is older brother trying to be a pharaoh in our household? And you might come up with some applications if you're working with older brother. Um, so, you know, just a variety of ways. But the biggest thing I think here is filtering everything that we learn through scripture. Last, well, not lastly, the next one is the unschooling approach. And John Holt actually um, uh, came up with this. And let me just read a little bit of what he said. And then we'll move into how we could apply this. He says, what children need is not new and better curricula, but access to more and more of the real world. Plenty of time and space to think over their experiences and to use fantasy and play to make meaning out of them. And advice, roadmaps, guidebooks to make it easier for them to get where they want to go, not where we think they ought to go. And to find out what they want to find out. Now, he has some really good things in here, I think that we, they need new and better curricula, plenty of time and space to think over their experiences, um, roadmaps, advice, guidebooks to make it easier for them to learn. But there is a little phrase in here that gives me a hard time. It says, to get them where they want to go, not where we think they ought to go, and to find out what they want to find out. You know, God gave each child parents, and parents are responsible. And we don't just let our kids go off and do whatever it is they want. There is a time to make choices. I'm not against choices, but we don't just give them a bunch of stuff and let them say, oh, just, oh, you're interested. Okay, well, let's just do that. I think it's very important that parents are intentional with their kids in homeschooling. So I think of one way that we could sort of twist this around. And I will tell you that Harvey Blue Dorn of Teaching the Trivium did say this. He says in Proverbs 29, 15, a child left to himself brings his mother to shame. And I think that is very important that we go back to is unschooling approach like John Holt defines it going uh, through the grid of scripture. Is that a proper way that we should homeschool our kids? I would say no. But one way we could do that is with a resource rich environment, all those roadmaps, guidebooks, advice, that's what we can do. We had a science bucket with all sorts of science experiments and science kits. We had an arts and crafts bucket. The kids, it was very accessible. We have books in every room of our house, even the kitchen, kitchen, cookbooks, but even other books. Um, and the younger you were, the lower your books were on the bookshelf so that you could actually read it. Toddlers were in baskets, so it was accessible to everyone. So I think it's important that we have a resource rich environment in this. And then we can go with a delight directed education. Find what is delightful to your kids. See what they are interested in and then work with your kids to help them in that area. It's not just a free for all. Let them do whatever they want, which is what it sort of comes across. Um, and if you're a type A person, this is probably not the best approach for you. Probably not for your kids type A engineering kind of person. But someone that's sort of a little more free willing, this might be something that you can do. But you may have this problem and it's called grandma and grandpa. And they're like, what in the world are you doing? And if you have that problem, you could use lap booking to show what you are learning. If you go to howtohomeschoolmychild.com slash lap booking, you can get some free lap booking pages. Lap booking, um, I should have put a picture of one in here, but basically it is. One way I use it is the manila folder and we open the manila folder and there's pockets for vocabulary words and there's accordion paper, maybe for timeline. And there's all sorts of hands on type ways that we record what we are learning. And it's a fun way to write down the things that you are re learning. So I would recommend a combination of a resource rich environment, delight direction, and then lap booking as a way to record what it is that your kids are learning. Then the last approach, and yes, I know I'm probably going, well, not too bad over, um, is the Christian leadership approach. I actually became a very eclectic homeschooler. I blended all the different approaches at different types. And then once I started studying the leadership approach and started doing it from a Christian, I started realizing really my what I was learning in the leadership education really took that eclectic view of education. And 
I still would filter everything through scripture, but I wanted to raise my kids with some even bigger goal. I wanted them to be Christian leaders. So that's why I bring goals around at the end. One of my goals, one of our goals was that our kids could run everything through the grid of scripture and that they could lead well. And they weren't, um, the people naturally followed them because they were wise and they were virtuous and they had a biblical worldview. One way that I do this is by using a wide variety. We use living books. Um, a lot of that Charlotte Mason approach we used in the younger five to 12 year olds. We use traditional books, traditional approaches more in the high school years when they needed to use a learn a body of information. I really didn't use it at all in those younger years. And we used unit studies off and on. It just depended on the topic. And we had a variety of ways depending on where the kids were in ages. Um, but we used just unit studies off and on according to what pe the kids, like I said, they were interested in astronomy. We did some stuff even in the high school. Formal classic. Well, actually, I used classic. I used a lot, like I mentioned, the memorization and songs and that type of thing in the younger grammar stage. The logic stage, we did some formal and informal logic. And then the older stage with rhetoric, we would write our research papers. We wrote... We did a lot of read, write, and discuss. And like I said, that's all in my teacher children how to think with mentoring and raising leaders, not followers book. But that's how we sort of incorporated that rhetoric, uh, understanding, thinking for yourselves. For the principal approach, we pretty much did everything throughout the whole time from a, a, a biblical worldview. Whatever we were studying, we wanted it to be through the biblical worldview. And then resource-rich environment, which I think is different than unschooling. We probably lean more towards that at the younger ages. But as far as delight directed, we actually let our kids make decisions in high school what subjects they would study. They had a humanities class that was required. After that, they made choices. And so from that perspective, they were doing that in the high school ages as well. I really encourage whatever you do, don't bring the classroom home. There are only so many hours in a day and you need to do what is most important and do the subjects that are most important at the appropriate ages. So let's just review. In deciding which approach is best for your children and for your family, remember you need to answer a few questions. What is your philosophy of education? How do you define an educated person? How do you relate that to Christian education? And then once you think through those big picture, what is education? What are your goals for each of your children? What are your goals for your family? And then I'd even put that aside for a week and then come back and think about these different approaches. Which approach matches your philosophy? Which approach matches your goals? And some of all of what I just mentioned is in my paperback. Every chapter has a study guide with questions for you to ask to help you make those choices. Remember that there is no single approach that's suitable for everyone. You've got to choose what is best for you, for your children, and for your family. Different children may need different approaches. And then your last question, what about gaps? Yep, there will be gaps, but you've got to choose which gaps you are going to have. Everyone has gaps. My choice was if we didn't finish a textbook in biology, oh well. But if my kids were really stumbling in character, we were going to stop. I didn't want I didn't want gaps in character. So that was something very important to us. Oh, there we go. Eclectic compliance at all. Let me just close with this. And I think it's very important. And this sort of sums up homeschool education and different approaches modeling and making those goals for you. These words which I command to you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. That's all the time. When you shall, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Whatever you're doing, you are training your children may not be formal training, but you are training nonetheless. You must decide what will happen during those hours of walking, sitting, working. Your children are going to see what's most important to you. So I would encourage you to seek God. He's going to show you how you can best educate your child. Remember, education and schooling are not equivalents. What do you want, an education or a schooling? 
I will be taking questions on my blog. If I did not cover your question, I will be answering some of those on my blog and Facebook. But remember that if there is one particular workshop that you want, you can go in and grab that here at howtohomeschoolmychild.com slash approaches. Or you can, oh, I didn't mean to put all of this in here. You can um, grab my paperback. And that's going to give you a lot of the same information, just the different methods, different ways of um, getting it, audio, video, or written. Um, or you can get the complete package. The complete package includes the paperback with the study guide inside of it. It includes all eight video recordings for all the different, there's an introduction, and then there's seven non-traditional approaches, and there's eight transcripts. My favorite thing is the digital resource guide that gives you all different resources for each of the different res um, approaches. And it's only 27, but it will increase every other day. Paperback is $16.95. And we already went through the 30 day money back guarantee. If you act, if you get it within the next 24 hours, uh, you can get Steve's Making Biblical Decisions and my nine practical daily tips for successful homeschooling, as well as through the entire week, you'll get the book lists, best books of all time. There's a book Gentry wrote, and it's chronological, and it's her favorite books of all times, um, starting with ancient times and going all the way to modern times. I guess I should have explained that a little bit better. Um, so those are all digital resources as well. And you can get all of this at howtohomeschoolmychild.com slash approaches, which I don't have on this slide, so I will go back. But if you were to buy all of these, including the workshop bonuses, it'd be $252.75 individually, but you can get them right now for $27 for the whole package or simply the paperback for $16.95. And you can go to howtohomeschoolmychild.com slash approaches slash approaches and that will get you there as well i want to thank you for your time my name is carrie beck with how to homeschool my child y'all have a great day